In mountain biking, there are things that we joke about. There are things that people proclaim passionately, and a lot of them aren't true. So today we're gonna talk about some mountain bike myths, whether there is some truth behind some of them, or whether they are in fact myths. Things like calling out your last run at a downhill park. So picture this, you drive six hours with your friends, you rent a place at tremendous cost, you ride all weekend, and then it's Sunday, late afternoon, and you say, guys, let's do one last run. One last run. And a bunch of people are like, we're gonna do another run. Don't drag me into this. Is there any truth to that? Ow. I think there might be. Now to be clear, it's not the actual noises that are coming out of your mouth uh, causing the, the trail gods to influence your run. That's not it. It's the mindset you're in. This is the end of the day. You're going to work the next day and this is your last run. And so that's plausible. Well, a lot of injuries do happen right at the end of the day when you're doing your last few runs. And so if you don't want to leave it up to chance, I would say make that decision when you're on the ground. Hey, you guys want to go up for another run? No, all right, let's go home. You know, don't, don't do it when you're about to drop in because that mindset does actually cause injuries. Unless you're racing or competing in some way, you never want to feel like it's do or die on a mountain bike recreationally, especially when you got to be at work the next day. Speaking of traveling with your bike, I've been at an airport before and had the TSA officer inspect my bike bag and say, hey, you got to let all the air out of your tires. The tires are gonna explode when the plane goes to altitude. Uh, that's not really the case. If you're on a jet cruising at 30,000 feet, just by altitude alone, you can expect the tire pressure to effectively increase by about 10 to 15 PSI. But that's not the only thing influencing your tire pressure. There's also temperature and where your bike is stored it's gonna get a lot colder. Now for every 10 degrees decrease in temperature, Fahrenheit, you're gonna lose about one to two PSI, and so some of this is offset. But even if it wasn't, your tire would not explode. So they recommend we inflate these tires between 17 and 35 PSI, and so if you have them inflated to 30, they could get up to 45 up there at elevation, and it's very unlikely that they're gonna blow off the wheel or something at that point. We did a video where we blew a tubeless tire off the rim by purposely overinflating it, and we needed a lot more pressure than that. It's also worth noting that most people don't run their tubeless tires at 30 PSI. It's probably gonna be more like the mid to low 20s. So if you're flying with your bike below you in the cargo area and you did not decrease your tire pressure, you don't have to lose sleep over it. You can sleep well during that flight. It's not often that I ride clipped in, but to explain this next myth, I have to to demonstrate. First, a quick disambiguation. Clipless pedals are actually the ones that you clip into. I know it's confusing, but topic for another day. The myth is that if you learn to bunny hop with clipless pedals, it will instill bad habits deep into your muscle memory that are very hard to get rid of. And I used to buy into this myth a little bit. Let me explain why people think this. I'm almost never clipped in, and you guys see me bunny hop all the time. I've bunny hopped onto picnic tables. Clearly, your feet don't have a whole lot to do with it. It's mostly in your arms, shifting your body weight, and of course, clipless pedals attach your feet to the pedals. And so if you're learning to bunny hop on clipless pedals, a shortcut is kind of just jumping up in the air and taking your bike with you, pulling up with your feet, and that would instill bad habits. That seems true, and so in a lot of bunny hop tutorials, people say, look, learn this with flat pedals. You're never gonna learn if you're doing it on clipless pedals because you're gonna wanna pull up. I could see how that's plausible, but if you are pulling up on your pedals to bunny hop, you're only gonna get like three or four inches off the ground. You're never gonna get anywhere with it because you're kind of implementing the wrong technique. People who are athletic, they have a general sense of how things work and how to move their body. They're gonna learn to bunny hop 
no matter what type of pedals. In no bunny hop tutorial are they gonna tell you to pull up with your feet. There comes a time where you have to get over something that's higher than four inches. And so you're gonna have to stop relying on that if you get any higher. And that's why it doesn't make sense that learning to bunny hop with clipless pedals is gonna make you unable to do it properly in the future. If you've learned to actually bunny hop with clipless pedals, you learn to bunny hop. And so I think that's a myth that's just gonna have to die. In my travels, I've seen way too many people bunny hop way higher and better than I can with clipless pedals who have always ridden clipless pedals. They learned that way, it's just impossible to ignore. <laughs> so the next myth has to do with quick release skewers and what side the lever is on. I will put together a bike and I'll see people in the comments, don't put the lever on the same side as the disc brake rotor. It could get caught in the disc brake. Simple thing you can do, just, just flip it the other way and put it on the derailleur side so that it can't get caught in the disc brake. First of all, as you can see, if you close it this way, it can't go into the disc brake. There's no way for it to. And if we turn it around this way, it's physically limited by how it's made where it can't go further than the disc brake. Now, that is not where the myth came from. There was a recall back in 2015 on quick release skewers that could actually go into the disc brake. And it only happened in the open position, which it will never be in if you install it properly. So what people in the comments asked me to do here is to pull it out, turn it around. Where the hell did the freaking thing go? They want it to come out this side. Now we're gonna adjust the tension and close it on the same side as the derailleur. Now, does this cause any problems? Is it gonna adversely affect your bike? No, and technically it does eliminate the possibility of it getting caught in your disc rotor. But there's no chance of it getting caught in your disc rotor because it's manufactured not to. Now it's worth noting on the disc brake side, you could close this in any direction and it won't present a problem. On the derailleur side, you could in theory close it in a direction that actually interferes with the derailleur in a really real way. And so yes, at one point in history, there was a bike part that was made a certain way where if installed improperly could cause a hazard, but it's an outdated concern that you don't really need to think about today. So the next mountain bike myth centers around fast engagement hubs and how it affects your suspension. Uh, let me explain. So this is a really fast engagement hub. It's an industry nine hub. Take a listen. You hear how the clicks are really, really close together? That's fast engagement. So the second you start pedaling, it starts making the back wheel move. Now on the Kent Travail, that's a really cheap and sloppy hub. And so there's a lot of movement before it actually catches and starts driving the wheel. Now it's also true that on a full suspension bike like this one, when the rear of the bike moves, the distance between your bottom bracket and cassette is actually changing a little bit and putting tension on the chain. And just like this hub engages quickly when you pedal, it actually works in the other direction. And so the myth is that fast engagement hubs are counterproductive because they negatively affect your suspension and make the pedals kick back. That is actually true. And in fact, some downhill racers will purposely choose hubs with slower engagement for this very reason. So if that's true and you have to pay more for really fast engagement hub that sounds cool, then why the hell do I have one on my bike? And the reason is in my particular situation, it's probably not gonna matter. First of all, a newer bike with more modern linkage is gonna have less pedal kickback. Second, it's really only gonna affect you if you are making a really hard compression at low speed. So if you were to do like a drop at really low speed, that's probably when you would feel it the most. And you would feel it the most on an old full suspension bike that also has a high engagement hub. Now on the contrary, a fast engagement hub is great for technical climbing where you're ratcheting the pedals and you need to get going quickly. And so for me, on a newer bike with modern linkage, the benefits really outweigh the downsides, but it's true. The next myth is about hex wrenches, specifically 
The ones with this little ball at the end, those are made for turning bolts at an angle. And people say in the comments all the time, don't use that, you're gonna ruin the bolt. There's a little more nuance to it than that. A really good example is a water bottle cage. Sometimes it's really hard to get a hex wrench in there to turn the bolts on a water bottle cage. And if you were to use this end, you would be doing like this, 150 times and it would take you an afternoon to put in a water bottle cage or you could poke this through an angle, get it down and then tighten the last little bit. Now, if you use the ball end, you will start screwing bolts up. You'll start to round out the inside until finally it doesn't even work anymore and that is using this improperly. That's not what it's designed for but I will have people jumping down my throat in the comments saying, don't use the ball end, it ruins things. So why is it there? <laughs> it's there to be used to just get the bolt in, to just do the distance. Then you torque it down proper. <music> Storing bikes vertically against the wall. Can it ruin your suspension? Some people claim it can, and I think that's a myth. So the theory goes when your bike is just sitting on the ground, all the oil in let's say your suspension fork is pulled up on the bottom where it's supposed to be and then if you hang it up on the wall now it could potentially pull up in a different spot leave different parts of your seals dry and then when you take it back down they're going to be all dried out and you're going to have problems i got news for you hanging a bike up on the wall for a long time might ruin your suspension but leaving it on the ground for a long time also will the problem is not hanging your bike vertically. The problem is just letting your bike sit there for a really long time. If you do that, something's gonna dry out and it's gonna need service. Now, this is gonna vary depending on where it's stored. If you're storing a bike for like, let's say a year and a half in your backyard in Dubai, you might have a problem. You might have some seals and things drying out, but in a climate controlled storage unit, maybe not. If you use your suspension for a year and a half, it's gonna need service. And so it seems like no matter what you're screwed, you're gonna have to service your suspension eventually, but I wouldn't worry about hanging it up in your garage to save space. If it does make a difference, it's pretty negligible. I store my bikes like that regularly, take them down, cycle the suspension a few times, and everything works fine. If you've spent any time digging deep into tech, you've heard of this, but if not, you're gonna think this is insane. Master links, the little quick links to attach a chain together. The companies like Shimano and SRAM say they're single use. You would only use it one time. If you use that to join a chain together, you're supposed to actually buy another one. That's true. Now, do I do that? Hell no. But there is some truth to it. If you're actually repairing bikes, you know it's a little bit more nuanced. Now, these quick links rely on friction to stay together and there's little ridges on the edge that kind of snap together to keep it in place. And every time this quick link is engaged or disengaged, it's wearing away at that metal. It's making it sloppier. And so that first time you engage a quick link, it's going to be the strongest it's ever been. And once you undo it and re-engage it, it's technically not as strong. Yet, I'm not the only person who doesn't replace my quick link when I take my chain on and off. Nobody does. I have not once to this day had somebody say, oh, you should really buy a new quick link because they don't want to get made fun of. So when you're using your master link pliers to disengage or re-engage your quick link, you should use your best judgment to know that it's in good condition. If it feels all sloppy, that's probably not safe to ride your bike with. And if it's making a nice, good, positive click, then you can trust it. It's not a myth, but don't buy a new quick link just because you cleaned your chain. I hope you guys enjoyed these mountain bike myths. We proved that some of them are true, some of them are false, and sometimes the truth lies in between. That's what makes these videos fun. I hope you learned something today, and if not, I hope you at least found this entertaining. If you know somebody that would like this video, please share it with them. Thanks for riding with me today, and I'll see you next time. I had another one, but we don't, like, there's no way we can get B-roll for it. Like, like e-bikes are for fat and lazy people.
But if you've ever met a lazy person, you can't get them to go out in the woods. They don't care if the bike runs on jet fuel. Like there's nothing that's gonna make them get up off the couch and go, like you have to act, if you've actually known a lazy person, you would know that that's not true. Lazy people don't even like type in what they wanna watch. They just, they just go like this for hours. Lazy people won't even fill up a water bottle. They just get like a 24 pack of bottled water at Office Depot. They're not loading an e-bike into a car and going out to the woods. Guarantee you that.